Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a blessing to be here, uh, not just at Emmanuel Baptist, but actually back in Australia. So I plan to program in as many um, excuses to be back in Australia over the next few years as I possibly can, within reason. And so thanks to Ryan, uh, thanks to uh, Emmanuel Baptist for being one excuse for me to be in Australia this time. Uh, of course, the flip side of that is it's very tiring going back and forth. And yesterday was a big day, so I'm tired, so pray that... I'm, but God is not tired, so uh, pray that He'll give me strength. I'd like to read uh, this morning, before we get into the guts of what I want to say, uh, several passages from Scripture. And the first one is in Genesis chapter 1, um, Genesis 1 and verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him, male and female, He created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Turn over to Genesis 2 and verse 7. Genesis, I'm, I'm actually assembling pieces of a jigsaw at the moment, um, and there's the first piece of the jigsaw, the, made in the image of God, made male and female, made with dominion, we're going to add another piece, Genesis 2-7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. The other piece that I want to gather from that is made from the dust. Go over to Genesis 5. And verse 1, it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, He made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, He created them and blessed them and named them man when they were created. Now, we just read that in Genesis 1. But note this, verse 3, When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in God's likeness after God's image, doesn't say that, does it? He fathered a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. Very forgotten part of this jigsaw. The image of God becomes the image of Adam. Turn to 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. First Corinthians fifteen twenty one. It says, For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Adam, Christ. In Adam, all die. In Christ, all shall be made alive. So, we've gone from the image of God to the image of Adam, and now we're talking about Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is the last one. Second Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And as you read on into chapter 4, uh, it speaks again of the image of Christ, which is the image into which we are being transformed. Now, why have I read uh, all of these pieces of a jigsaw puzzle? 
Um, once upon a time, you would have attributed these scriptures to something that we call the doctrine of man. Um, today, uh, with the buzzwords of our culture, we would call it identity. Um, and to some, uh, this idea of identity, uh, which is very prevalent in our culture at the moment, you hear that word often, uh, you hear it in terms of identity politics, uh, you hear it in terms of, you know, just talking about who we are, what my identity is, uh, and increasingly you hear it in churches, you hear it in Christian circles. We now talk about something called identity in Christ, for example. Um, and so this is a word which has been popularized, and I think to one generation it may sound a little bit like a whole lot of mumbo-jumbo, because it's not a question that you ever asked, it's not a question you ever felt the need to answer. But now, this is the major preoccupation of an entire generation, um, and it's spreading very quickly. Uh, we are told, or they are told, that the meaning of life is substantially tied up with answering the identity question. If they can find out what their identity is, they can then really find a blueprint for how to live and interact with the world. Uh, and really, when it comes to this identity question, what is it? Well, in a nutshell, stripping back all the details, it is the question, who am I? And if you read the uh, literature on this, if you look at the examples of primary school curriculum that teach on identity, you'll find some common themes. You'll think, see things like your sense of who you are, how you feel about yourself, your self-perception, your passions, your story, your life experiences, your personal attributes, your personality, your, your, your self-definition, your self-image, your self-concept, your self-narrative, your self-perception. There's a common prefix in a lot of these, self, self, self. This is just who I am. This is my identity and I will be my best self. You know, when I was growing up, um, we used to have an insult. Uh, you're so full of yourself. Uh, and, you know, it was kind of wounding when someone said that to you. But how things have changed. Um, to be full of oneself is no shameful error anymore. It, it's kind of held up as an ideal to love yourself. We hear it all the time, to live authentically, to be authentic to yourself, true to yourself, to write yourself story, um, to be your best self, whatever that means. Uh, you just do you. That's what the world says. That's the message of pop culture and influences and very much the message of the education system at present. In fact, uh, primary curriculum is just full of this stuff. Uh, and I must say, uh, some bad ideas on this are filtering into the Christian education system as well. Um, but see, here's the thing, the question I always ask when these new fads come along is, is it really a good idea? You've got to think critically about this stuff and not just be a passenger. And we can settle for shallow answers, uh, you know, there's the Lauren Daigle answer of, um, uh, you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing, you know, it's kind of like the fortune cookie answer to the question. Um, you can't quite refute it, but it really is not the whole story. And it might be uh, a bubble of butterflies to get you through a day to feel good about yourself, uh, but he also says we deserve to die. So what about that? Um, what's the whole picture? What's the whole answer to the question? And we need to answer the question in full, because if we don't answer it in full, we'll be vulnerable to a lot of bad ideas on all of this. Um, but identity is that question at the root, who am I? And really, that's the problem. Because as soon as I say those words, as soon as they come out of my mouth, I'm instinctively doing something. I am already looking at myself. Who am I? Oh, I don't know. I look at myself, I look within. And that question invites the selfward look. It invites the inward look. Um, and therefore, we are in an age of the self. We have never had more phrases like I rattled off before with the prefix self. Psychology is a huge force in our culture at the moment. It's obsessed with this stuff. Uh, the academic uh, echelons of education are obsessed with this stuff. 
I uh, was trying to think, well, where can I find some contemporary expressions of what people mean when they talk about identity and who am I and all this kind of thing. And um, there's lots of places you can go, and I've read some journal articles, I've read some kids' books, there's lots of kids' books on the subject now. Um, but you know, one place you can go if you want to get a nice summary of what's been written, and it may have a very, say, let's say, contemporary edge to it, is you can just ask ChatGPT, right? And uh, I did. I got a pretty interesting answer, and one that accorded with what I'd been reading. It said, identity refers to the characteristics, traits, beliefs, values, and experiences that define who a person is. It encompasses the sense of self and how individuals perceive themselves and are perceived by others. And at the individual level, it talks about, it refers to a person's qualities, self-perception, thoughts, emotions, desires, and personal history. Uh, and it says it is shaped by personal introspection. And then it says it's important to note that identity is subjective and can be fluid. So, it says identity defines who a person is. There's very few questions than that that, you can, that are bigger than that that you can ask. Who is God is a bigger question, but who am I? What is a person is a pretty big question. There's a whole category of theology dedicated to it. But, in answering that question, it says it's important to note that identity is subjective. In other words, there are no bedrock standards from outside of yourself on which to anchor your identity. Your identity is merely the product of how you feel about yourself. It is entirely a subjective exercise. And we look within and say, what do I see? How do I feel? That's the answer to the question. Now, this is the same as saying, the identity question in the modern world is answered like this, it is answered through me creating myself. Me deciding who I am, me deciding what I am. It's not saying, well, God created a certain thing. It's saying, no, I create my own self-definition. Who I am is defined by how I feel at a given time. And there is no creator greater than me in this matter. What, what God has said is irrelevant. How do I know that? Well, when it comes to this identity stuff, you constantly see people overriding God's hand on their personhood. Uh, for example, we read in Genesis chapter 1, he, male and female, He created them. But when there's no creator greater than me in the matter of identity, I don't have to be bound by those categories. Those categories have no claim on how I should live. They have no claim on how I should perceive myself, because I create myself. You read on in Genesis 2, and why did God make a male and female? He made a male and female so that they could be united in marriage in 99% of cases. Okay, well, when God has no claim on who I am, when He has no claim on how I have been made and what I have been made for, I decide all that for myself. I can marry whoever I want, as many times as I want, in as many ways as I want, or not at all as I please. And so I go on. You see so many areas in which the subjective self-definition I create myself mentality overrides what God has said and what God has put in place when He created the human race. This is rebellion. It is robbing God of His authority and it is giving it to the individual. It is saying, I am the Creator now and I will get to say who I am and how I live regardless of anything that He might have done. It's a philosophy that is being used to rewrite the order of creation in the ways I've just said. The gender one is a huge one, the sexuality one is a huge one. Um, but it's also being used to make racial differences into something that they are not. To make racial differences into insurmountable barriers between our humanity so we share nothing in common. And that's what the critical race theorists teach. Um, now, that's not true. There's one race, we share everything that really matters in common, including truth itself. Um, we use this to, you know, and this is so embedded in the culture, I mean, we've just come out of what, Pride Month, just a couple of months ago, uh, and that really is the ultimate exaltation of the self. That really is the ultimate of, in saying, this is what I am, God says, no, I don't care. 
And not only do I not care, and not only will I pursue it anyway in rebellion, but I will force others to affirm it and to celebrate it. It is Romans 1, uh, where it talks at the end of Romans 1 about they not only do these things, but they affirm those who practice them. Um, I can make myself now. I am the creator. I am sovereign over who and what I am. And what God has said and God's blueprints do not matter. That's where we are with the who am I question. I want to point out a few practical consequences of this. I was at a school a few days ago um, and I felt burdened to kind of address this in a fairly direct way because I think schools are a place where this stuff is sometimes at its worst. And in the school, I said, you know, what does the Bible say about our identity, really? Um, the Bible doesn't use the word identity. And it doesn't really use the word self in the way that we use it. But when you understand what identity means, that it is our subjective sense of who we are, well, you go, well, okay, the Bible talks about the heart a lot. And when the Bible talks about the heart, it is talking about our passions, it's talking about our desires, it's talking about the desires of our life and our personality, it's talking about our subjective insides. Um, and Jesus talked about the heart. And Jesus, you know, before I get there, I said to these young people, it's very easy to work out whether or not this identity theory of life is a good idea or not. Because if it is all based on the self, all we need to ask is, is the self good or bad? Is the heart of men and women good or bad? And when we find the answer to that question, we understand whether this is a good way to live. Because once you find out who you are, you are supposed to champion it, celebrate it, live it out, and also engage in a political sort of uh, crusade as well. Uh, if you are uh, one of these minority identities, then that's your politics, you go for it. Is it, all a good, is it all built on a good foundation or not? Well, is the self good? Answer the question. If it's good, yeah, we're onto a good thing here. Woohoo, let's go. If the self is bad, well, we've got a problem. And listen to one of the most countercultural statements in all of Scripture. There's a few, but this is a big one. Jesus warned about the heart. He said, actually, whatever comes out of a person is what defiles him. From within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. It's hard to write a song about that, isn't it? Um, Jesus says, what is the heart of man? A defiling influence. What lives in the heart of men? Every evil thing. And I said to these young folks, you know, you look at the world and you, uh, you know, people are, young people are very politically astute, are, are, are very politically engaged these days. They, they all want to get into politics. They all want to go and change the world, be world changers, right? And you look at the world, you go, ah, oh, look, the politics is so divided, people are so opposed to each other, everything's falling apart, you know, oh, look at all these structures of sin and how bad it is. I'm like, I said, you know why it's like that? Because you're like that. In your heart, you can't get on with your parents. You can't get on with your siblings. You're having fights with each other right now. You'll have fallings out all through your life. Strife, divisions, envy, jealousy, it's everywhere. In you, and that's why it's there. That's the human condition. The heart of man is the home of every evil thing. And you know, we can test this. If this is true, if Jesus is right about the heart of man, then this whole identity theory of living, this whole explosion of being full of ourselves, it's going to have some bad consequences. You know, Jesus says here, what lives in the heart of men? Oh, well, um, sexual immorality, uh, sensuality, uh, adultery. Have we got a problem with that at the moment? Has there ever been a more sexually perverse generation in the West? Pride. Um, oh, surprise. Because we're saying to people, oh, that's how you feel, is it? Well, it's very compassionate to just let you express it uh, and live that way. Oh, okay, well, we're reaping the consequences. Um, what about an explosion in pride? Well, we just talked about that. But generally, I mean, clinicians are telling us we're getting a bigger and a bigger problem with narcissism. Well, it's no surprise. You know this thing? You know what you do all day long when you're like this? 
you are thinking about yourself and you're thinking about yourself and you're thinking about yourself and you're thinking about yourself and then you take a selfie and you put it up and then you're th- looking at the likes and getting the oh look someone liked it ooh, ooh, ooh. and then the next day you've got to do another one look this is what I'm up to today oh some more likes you're thinking about yourself you're thinking about yourself a lifetime of that how it bends you out of shape boy oh boy explosion in narcissism surprise got to get off our devices and I do have a thing by the way this might skewer some people a bit hard I'm sorry about this but I do have a thing I don't think it's I don't think selfies are right on the whole I'm sure there's exceptions Uh, there are moments you want to remember and all that kind of thing but the kind of gross kind of selfie culture where you're photographing yourself and being like check me out and you know and people people moralize it by putting a bible verse over it I mean, <laughs> it's kind of sick. Thinking about yourself. And, you know, it's that whole vaunting of the self. It's the spirit of the age. Um, I know when people laugh like that, that I've hit something. We got it. Um, here's another one, an explosion in deceit. Do you know, I was reading a, deceit was one of the things that Jesus listed. And I was actually reading a, 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 a study of American Generation Z, or Z as they say in America. Um, and uh, that's people sort of in their early 20s, late teens, that kind of age. And they were surveying them on a whole bunch of moral issues. And it was unsurprising, is homosexuality wrong? Overwhelmingly, no. Uh, is it okay to live together before marriage? Overwhelmingly, yeah, that's fine. Uh, and so on. But here was one that really surprised me. It's only something like 30%, less I think than 30%, or maybe about that, of American Generation Zers that believe that lying is morally wrong. Isn't that interesting? Shocked me, but then I thought, well, hang on, it's not so surprising, is it? Because Jesus says, well, what's in the heart? Deceit. So you're going to justify it, aren't you? You can say, oh, there's a time and a place to lie. Hmm, is there? Um, so what we're doing is we're asking a generation to look at their sin. That's what we're doing. When we say, find yourself, your true self, and vaunt it, live it out, express it, oh, okay, take a hold of sin and run with it. That's what we're doing. And if that was true, if Jesus' warning was true, if Jeremiah's warning was true, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? Then we would see an explosion in these things, in our culture, and we do. We do see that explosion. But briefly, let me mention these two things. If you're living that way, You are, by definition, cutting yourself off from hope, because hope, by definition, is beyond you. It survives the ups and downs in life. It survives the likes on the Instagram. It survives the crises. It survives the stuff that might happen to you that afflicts your sense of who you are. It's bigger than all of that. And if you're living this way, if this is the platform for the the basic foundation for your life, then the only hope you have is that you will feel good about yourself. So what happens when you don't feel good about yourself? What happens when yourself is not in the shape that you wish that it was? Well, it's a big problem because only 45% of American young people say that they feel in good mental health. Where's their hope? One in seven has had a serious psychological event in the last month. One in seven has had a major depressive disorder in the last year, and that's almost doubled since 2008. So is the last statistic. One in ten has thought of suicide in the last month. That's almost doubled since 2008 as well. There's been a 56% increase in suicide rates among Generation Z since 2007. Um, I have a family member who works in one of the biggest children's hospitals in Australia. And they are dealing with an absolute influx of 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds committing suicide. Where does that come from? It's not normal. I mean, I think it's, it's the internet. That's what it is. They're getting into dark places. But we have this massive problem of hopelessness in our culture. We have young people who have no hope because we're locking them into themselves. And also consider this. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're surrounded by people who you can't trust. I used to work in politics. It happened a lot. And you're surrounded by people you can't trust, right? It has a, it has a, there's lots of good things about leaving the political world, let me tell you. Uh, but there's, 
it has a profoundly destabilizing effect on you. You, you actually need to get out of that environment. Uh, you you, you kind of get all gaslit and everything. You don't know what's going on and what's true. Is there anything less trustworthy than a teenager's feelings? Is there anything more changeable than a teenager's feelings? No, not really. Um, maybe the waves of the ocean, and even then, uh, at least there's a consistency to them. Um, can you imagine the anxiety of trusting your feelings? And it is true, we've got the most depressed and the most anxious generation in the history of the Western world. Um, is that a surprise? No, it's not a surprise. This is a, a picture of, you know, unfolding tragedy in a generation. It is. Um, there's going to be a lot more of this. Where did it all go wrong? Do you know where it went wrong? <laughs> it's interesting. So I, we've talked a little bit about Martin Lloyd-Jones um, over the last 24 hours, uh, myself and Andrew and Ryan and others and, and Matthew. Uh, and um, I always remember he did a series on spiritual depression and uh, he called it the mumps and measles of the soul. And uh, they did, he became quite famous for it, ended up writing a book on it. And it's interesting because the, the, the theme that he took up immediately following spiritual depression uh, was when he started his series on Ephesians. And he really opened with a discussion of the glory of God. And I remember listening to one of his sermons and he said, you know, we were talking about spiritual depression these last few months. Uh, and he said, and he goes, he goes, and you know, he says, I think we rather enjoyed ourselves. Um, and he made an excellent point, which is that people never tire of talking about themselves. They never tire of talking, of, of delving into what makes them tick, their own psychology, how they feel, why they are the way they are, and people get quite in, you know, you get a very attentive audience when you talk about these things. Uh, and then he said, uh, and then we moved on to the glory of God. And he said, I think it's safe to say people weren't nearly as excited. Um, and that's a tragedy, right? It's a sad commentary on how we are. Uh, I think it means we don't know God well enough, because if we did, um, we would rejoice all the more to be discussing that topic and all the more interested. But I raise that because um, I'm writing a book on this subject at the moment, and I nearly started with the antidote, which is the opening words of the whole Bible, in the beginning, God. Before God says anything about anything, He starts with His own perspective. He raises our eyes upwards to see Him and then to see what He has done. And there we find wisdom, there we find truth. And that is why the Proverbs say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, that's not just a fortune cookie, that is a truth, because if you start with God, you start where everything started. And He gave everything its place, He gave everything its order, he gave everything its meaning, He gave everything its definition, and when we see it from His perspective, we understand it rightly, and we gain wisdom because we know how to interact with it according to truth. Um, but if I start with the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, in the beginning God, people aren't so interested as me starting with, who am I? That's a little bit more enticing, right? But this is the answer. God made everything. Wisdom requires that we turn to Him. And the Christian mind on all things, concerning anything at all, if you want to know the truth about it, if you want to understand it, if you want to interact with it rightly, begin always with God. And this is something we have to train ourselves to do, because the effect of psychology on us over the last 70, 80 years, since Jung and Reynolds and Freud and all of those guys, is such that we always start with how we feel. Always. And we always start at the horizontal plane. It's either how we feel or how our friends feel or this personal story or that example in my life. Don't start there. Start with God, with truth, with foundations. And people say, oh, it's not very nuanced and gracious and loving. I tell you what, the only way you can be nuanced and gracious and loving is if you do it according to truth. Find out what the truth is and then apply it. And we must begin with God. And when it comes to who am I, that impulse to look within is so the wrong impulse. The impulse we should have is say, well, who is, what has God done in this matter? How has God made the human race? What is His answer? 
And the first piece of the puzzle was there in Genesis 1.26, that He made us in the image and likeness of God. And again, people take that as some kind of motivational speech, uh, and they sort of think, that's great, we're made in the image of God, let's go and have a good time. Um, okay, there's a bit more to it than that. Um, and also, it's probably the only compliment the human race gets in the entire Bible, um, and it's before the fall, uh, there's a lot of negative feedback thereafter, so don't get ahead of yourselves. Uh, don't let's run away with that in isolation, but it's a good place to start, because it tells us what we were made for. It tells us how we were made when God said, very good. And that's the blueprint, that's where we begin. Now, people say, and we've always got to ask the question, we hear phrases and we don't always delve into them, like identity, we don't always say, well, what is identity? Image of God's another one, what is it? What does it mean? What is the image of God? Um, it's interesting, uh, I've told this story once before, um, so apologies if you've heard it, but there was a supporter a few years ago uh, who mailed a package to the ACL office, uh, and we opened it, and it was a, it was a portrait of me, it was a painting of me, and um, uh, it was evident that this person who had painted the portrait had artistic talent, because uh, she had captured me really well. Uh, and I thought, that's actually a really well done painting. But I had a problem, because I, I, I'm not going to put it on my wall. Um, I mean, in a selfie culture, you never know. Uh, but I wasn't going to do that. Uh, I think Anthony, Anthony Fauci, I think, has his portrait on his wall in his office. Yeah, someone said yes. I think he's actually got multiple portraits in his office. Yeah, they're still nodding. We're not going to do that, right? Uh, that's the sign of something wrong. Um, I thought, I can't put it on my wall, what will I do? And so I got an idea and I mailed it to my mum and she hung it on her wall and <laughs> that's fine, right? Uh, and it sits on the wall above her piano and I was up in Brisbane uh, a few months ago and uh, you know, every Friday night all the sort of grandchildren or nieces and nephews, my nieces and nephews, come over uh, and uh, I was talking to them all about identity because it's a big deal, and they've just been going through it. Uh, there's a, some of them go to a, a government school, and they've been talking about it at school. And so I sat down, was telling them all about identity. And to make it a point, I pointed at the portrait, and I said, see that portrait over there? Uh, and they all yelled out together, that's you! Um, and here's the thing, it actually, and I said, actually, it's not me. I'm standing here. That's my image. But it's such a good image that you can see something really essential about me in it. You can see me in that picture. And here's the thing about human beings, when they were made, you could actually see something intrinsic to God in man and woman as the crown of God's creation. And the thing that you could see in them is actually explained to us by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians and Colossians. Uh, and I don't see this discussed much, except in very old books. Um, these days, we kind of go on a flight of fancy about what is the image of God. Oh, well, that's why we love each other, and that's why we have, uh, that's why we're creative and we can build things, and that's why we think so clearly and we're rational, because God is rational, and God loves, and God builds, and maybe. The Bible doesn't say that. But what the Bible does say is in Colossians 3 and 10, and Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. And in Colossians 3 and 10, it tells us about, both passages are actually about something called the new self, which we're not going to go in today, into today. But the point it makes is that the new self is actually the image of God. Um, and it says, put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created it, the image of the creator, the image of God. The new self is likened to the image of God. And the same in Ephesians 4.22, in reference to your former way of life, you are to rid yourselves of the old self, which has been corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you are to put on the new self, or you are to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, which, and listen again, in the likeness of God, again, image of God language, has been created in true righteousness and holiness. The new man is likened to the image of God and the likeness of God, and the qualities that are ascribed to it in so doing are threefold. One, it is holy. Two, it is righteous. 
three, it is being renewed in the knowledge of God. And so human beings, when they were made in the image of God, were made holy. They were made righteous. And they were made knowing God. That's the guts of the issue, right there. The crux of the thing. Um, and it may well be that those other things that we look at and we say, oh, humans have got a rational intelligence that the animals don't have, or um, humans have, uh, you know, incredible creative abilities that animals don't have, or humans have relational in the way that the animals aren't, and that's all true. But when we understand what the crux of the matter is in the image of God, we realize why we are like that. We are like that, that we might display the holiness of God and, and act in a way that is righteous according to God's standard. Because holiness speaks to us of purity, sinlessness. Um, God uh, is described in the Bible, His essence is holiness, and that's why His image is always going to have holiness in it. That's at the heart of who God is. The theologians call it the attribute of attributes, the one that really houses all of the others. Uh, it tells us He's perfect. Well, why is He perfect? Because well, He's love, because He's good, because He's uh, because he's grace, because he's just, because all these things. And it tells us that he's distinct. Why is he distinct? Well, he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, and so on. And we're going to see that those incommunicable attributes, his omnipotence, his omniscience, his infinity, his aseity, they're not accessible to us. But the moral perfections are. And that is the way we were made, to put his moral perfections on display. And righteousness is really the doing of what is holy. Righteousness is right actions. And so we're given this mind, we're given these faculties, we're given, you know, hands to work for God, minds to think for God, lives to, to animate for God from holiness in righteousness. But also we're given these things because we've got another unique ability that the animals don't have. I mean, when was the last time you saw a couple of dogs looking at a sunset asking, is there a God? Um, doesn't happen, does it? You don't get camels wandering in the desert asking each other philosophical questions about creation. Um, why? Well, they don't have the faculties for it, clearly. But we do have faculties for what? To know God. And that is why throughout all of human history, the human race has occupied itself with philosophical questions, questions of ultimate meaning, and all this kind of stuff. Because that's what we were made for. We were made to be in relationship to God. And you read Genesis 1 to 3, and one of the things you see time and again, you know, that there is closeness to God, there is communion, communion with God, they walk with God in the garden in the cool of the day, and all this kind of thing. And what happens when sin comes in? They're hiding. They're fugitives, they're running away, they're doing this. And isn't that what our culture is doing right now? Because they're exalting themselves, raising themselves up against God, and they're saying, la, 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 not listening, don't tell me about Him. They're just like Adam in the garden, running from God. But it's not, for what, it's not what we were made for. We were made for holiness. We were made to act righteously. And we were made to know God. However, there's a more humbling piece to the puzzle. We're made in the image of God, we're all made for all these great things. Uh, turn the page, as we all did, and we find out that we're made from dust. It's not quite as, it doesn't leave us quite as high-minded. And it's important to know this, though, that although we were made to image God, although that was the calling on the human race in creation, and although, yeah, we had many great faculties and we continue to have remnants of all these things uh, to do good and to do righteously, to be holy, to be like God in that way. Um, there is a sense in which, well, the other truth is we are not gods. We are creatures. We are part of the stuff of creation. Um, like I said, there are parts of God that belong to Him as God. We will never have His aseity, we'll never be self-existing. Uh, in Him, we have our life and breath and everything, says the Apostle Paul, we're completely dependent. Um, you know, we will never have uh, His omniscience. Um, nothing in all creation, not the angels, nothing has His omniscience, and so on. 
We are creatures. And this is a very, very important part of the jigsaw for us to remember in today's world. Uh, there is much made of the image of God. There is not much made of the dust. And I ask myself, why? Because it's there. And I think a big part of the reason why is because it is humbling in the face of the culture that we live in. Because the culture that we live in is at war with this truth. The culture that we live in wants to be, as Adam and Eve did in the first temptation, they want to be like God. And I gave a clear example just before with the whole identity thing. How are we being like God in the question of who am I? We are creating ourselves. We are taking the creation order that God has given and we are saying we are the creators now, we're getting too big for our boots, we're stepping beyond our bounds as dust and we are making ourselves according to our own moral boundaries and our own blueprint. And really that's probably what it meant in Genesis when Adam and Eve were tempted, it says to be like gods, knowing good and evil. Again, to be in that position where you have some knowledge of good and evil and therefore you have the ability to declare what is evil good and what is good evil and live according to your own moral path rather than the one that God has set down. And that's what we're doing today. Um, this pride movement is a classic example, but you look at so many of the social issues of the day, and I was going through this yesterday, and you see how that this is people raising themselves up against God and His authority. The transgender issue is a key one. We are raising ourselves up against God and His authority. We're saying that the fingerprint of His design in our creation means nothing for how we ought therefore to live and understand ourselves. Well, newsflash, it means a great deal. But when we want to defy Him and raise ourselves up against Him, we put that to one side. The sexuality issue is another one. Uh, the, you know, many human races issue is another one. Pro-life is another one. You know, we don't actually want to, our culture doesn't want to come up with a moment when a life is a life, because they actually want the ability to say whether it should live or not, based on how they feel about it. And that's the reality. If it's not wanted, it's not a life. If it is wanted, we do everything to save it. What are we doing? We're raising ourselves up against God's authority. God has defined what life is. It is not ours to define. God has defined what male and female and gender is. It's not ours to define. God has defined what marriage is. It's not ours to define. It's not the government's to define. God has defined what the human race is. It's not ours to define. This is the sin of our day. It is everywhere. Um, we even, by the way, raise ourselves up too far, and I'm not um, dismissing all environmental stewardship and that kind of thing, but what I am saying is this, what's going on in the culture at the moment in relation to the environment is the view that we are in charge of the planet's ultimate destiny, and we are not. God has said, ever since Genesis 8, that seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter shall not cease, so long as the earth remains, He has a program for the planet. He'll sort that out. We don't need to freak out that this place is going to end in 12 years. It, well, it might if Jesus comes back, but only if Jesus comes back, right? Um, and I know there's two schools of thought on this, but I, I do quite like what John MacArthur says, somewhat provocative. He says, if you think we're messing up the planet now, wait till you see what Jesus does with it when He comes back. Um, <laughs> we are raising ourselves up against God. It's no clearer than in the identity debate. But let me quickly mention this bit. Um, and I've mentioned this one before, but it's important. Um, you see this a lot. Uh, you know, I did a video for when I was uh, a Truth of It video some time ago where I, I deconstructed a whole bunch of stories of these uh, so called deconverters, high profile Christians who decide that they're no longer Christians. Uh, and so they come out and do a big long podcast or a media interview saying why they're not a Christian and why it's all a whole lot of hocus pocus, even though they were in the church for 20 years. It's very sad. Um, but if you read their, uh, what they write, and I, and I did, I had a researcher compile about 12 different examples, it was amazing to me, I, I saw the same thing over and over and over again, it was like reading the same story 12 times. Uh, and there was an important feature that came up every single time, and it would often be captured in this phrase, they would actually get to the point where they would say in their reasoning and thinking, if I was God, if I was God, kids wouldn't die. If I was God, evil wouldn't exist. If I was God, 
I'd just show up and reveal myself if I was God. You know, there's an example in Scripture, there's many examples in Scripture of this very thing, but one of the most powerful is when Jesus is on the cross um, and he is uh, there and there are mockers who come by and they say, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In other words, hey, if we were God, we wouldn't be dying up there. If we were God, we wouldn't have got ourselves into this situation. You know what, I'm sure glad they're not God. And I'm sure glad that God is a lot smarter than they are, a lot wiser than they are, and far better at bringing His purposes to pass through the ups and downs, the goods and evils, and the highs and lows of this fallen world than we ever could be. If we were God for one millisecond, we'd be immediately baffled by the ludicrous, ludicrous complexity of the cosmos, and it would de-atomize in front of us. And yet, the miracle is that in the midst of all this complexity, and in the midst of evil itself, Scripture says that God is bringing all things, all things, uh, He's ordering all things according to the counsel of His will. And there is a day coming that He is bringing to pass in His way to show His glory when all of this will be resolved. Oh, but if I was God, I'd be better. How outrageous! Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God, says the Apostle Paul. We have forgotten that we are creatures of the dust. And so we must never forget a dual reality. We must never forget that we were made for glory. Because if we forget that we were made for glory, we will be content to live like animals. And many people around us are living like animals, indulging their passions, indulging their appetites, all the debasing effects of sin. But also, we must never forget that we were made from the dust. Because if we forget that we were made from the dust, then we will wish to be as gods. And we will become arrogant. And we will become rebellious. And we will start doing things like creating ourselves. It is a dual thing. We were made for glory. We are not animals. Um, we were made from dust. We are not gods. However, it's important for us to understand a very important context in our time that is so forgotten. And I've alluded to it already. I've alluded to the fact that these things are not as they once were. This order is not in the order that God made it. And the answer really comes to us in Genesis 5, when we see that very important reality that Adam was made in the image and likeness of God when God made mankind male and female. But the subtle change in language is something that is picked up in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 5 and other places, when it says, then Adam had a son in his own image and in his own likeness. And I don't think there's really many theologians that would say we, are, we no longer possess the image of God, but all of them would say that there is a degree of ruin and brokenness attached to it. Um, I think that a useful way to think about this is to remember that actually we bear Adam's image. And in Adam's image is a fragment, is a broken down relic of God's image. But it's a fragment and it's broken down because other things are there now that were not in God's pure image. Sin is there, death is there. Through Adam, it says in Romans 5, uh, sin came into the world and sin passed to all men and then all sinned. And then in Corinthians, we read that as in Adam all die, sin and death came in to substantially um, 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 erode and substantially undermine the tr true holiness and righteousness that was there and to undermine our knowledge and relationship with God because we are cut off from God by our sin. We do not know God as we ought to because of sin. Um, it's a little bit like, uh, I was in uh, Europe of 2017 uh, and I was there for the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation and we, me and two friends were traveling all around Germany and Switzerland and, and, and went to all the, followed the footsteps of the reformers. That was a great trip. But one of the things we loved to do as we were going along was spy out all the castle ruins that were on the hilltops around us. And whenever we saw one, we'd try and get to it. Some of them were easy to get to, some were more challenging, some had roads, some you had to climb. And we'd climb up to these castles and it was interesting, uh, we'd often call them castles. But of course, when you got there, depending how old they were and whether or not they'd been made into a tourist attraction, 
Um, you could kind of say they were castles, uh, but more accurately, they were ruins of castles. Uh, sometimes if there was a, a plaque or there was a, 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 some kind of setting around them, you might have a story about what it once was. And you might have, you know, Count Von, you know, Trap once lived here. Uh, and you'll see the story and you'll see the artist impression of what it used to look like in its full glory. And you think, wow, what a place. Wow, imagine being here back then. And oh yeah, they've got a great view of the river for security. And oh, and you can dream it all up. But see, it's a little, it's a great, um, it's a great metaphor of the human condition. Are we still castles? Kind of. I mean, the the foundations are kind of there. There's like a turret hanging up over here. You can sort of see some of the glory of what it once was. Um, but my goodness, it's damaged. My goodness, it's not what it once was. In fact, it, it's not even doing the job it used to do. Because the job it used to do was no God. And the castle's job was to house people and be a defense and a fortress. No one can live there now. It's got no roof. But the relic is there. The ruin is there. And you know, as that sign said, you know, Count such and such once lived here. You could have a sign on our head that said, God once lived here. Because we are now bearing Adam's image. Uh, we are now in the fall when we do not know God, when holiness has become foreign to us, when righteousness eludes us continually. Um, and the other things that are mentioned there are spoiled as well. You know, male and female, he created them. What for? Perfect harmony. Wow, we're a long way away from that, aren't we? Uh, the battle of the sexes continues. Uh, and most of the political ideologies around us have conflict narratives built in for men and women and other categories of people. Um, all this is spoiled. So we must never forget that we are not currently the person who we were called to be. The world says that you should be yourself. It tells us that being your best self is what life is all about. But the Bible says, no, there is a person who you are not who you are called to be. Um, you know, the Christians should never double down on who they are and say, oh, that's just who I am. Yeah, you're a sinner. That's who you are. Careful. Um, the Christian is being transformed into another person. That's a crucial thing to grasp. And it seems kind of obvious, but in today's world, it's got to be said. Because it's a, it's a crucial difference. And our world hates the truth that within our hearts, as Jesus said, is all this sin. And that by ourselves, we can't do it. And so our world hates the gospel. Because it accuses them of the thing that they've been resisting. Which is that in their heart dwells every evil thing. We know what has gone wrong. Let me close with this theme. How do we recover what's been lost? Uh, some time ago, uh, when I was first putting together a series uh, on sort of creation blueprints for cultural issues, uh, I looked at the image of God thing in Genesis and then I decided to do a bit of a word search throughout the Bible for sort of image, likeness, and similar terms, so I could try and find out where this concept is mentioned again as you go through Scripture and what is said about it. And something jumped out to me when I did that. I realized that after the fall, usually this concept of the image and likeness of God is not actually raised when Scripture is talking about you and me. It is raised when Scripture is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Scripture teaches us in the New Testament that He is the image and likeness of God. Some examples, Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Hebrews 1 and 3, He is the brightness of God's glory, the express image of His person. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And I'd like to start something as I speak about this topic around the place. When we think of image of God, can we not think about ourselves? Can we think about Jesus? Because in Jesus, you have 
you know, to put it this way, you have the glory of God and the dust of human flesh brought together perfectly once again. Lost in the fall, brought back in Jesus Christ. And what does John say? We've seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. His moral character was the holiness of God on earth. He is where we find the true image of the invisible God. And the wonder of the Gospel is this, that through repentance and faith in Him, you can actually have a link with Him and His image, which is the glorious image of God, which is as real as the biological link you have this morning to Adam himself. You have a biological link to Adam in your genetics, and his image is strong in your flesh. But in salvation, as the New Testament continually says, we are placed into Christ, in Christ, in Christ. How? There is a Holy Spirit that dwells in you and a spiritual link that is just as real to His new nature, His image, the true image that is holy, that is righteous, and in whom we find the true knowledge of God Himself. He is the blueprint, He is the restoration that we need. And that has two practical implications. The first one is, as that link is forged, we find that we are changing. And we read that scripture, 2 Corinthians 3.18, changing from one degree of glory into another, into His image. And that's the reality of the Christian life. Uh, I was listening on a completely different topic to a, 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 a preacher uh, online, a guy who was, most of the guys I listen to are dead now, and he's dead now, but he was uh, a great preacher in Scotland, a guy called Eric Alexander. And uh, he was talking about the fact that he had just been in the United States doing a speaking tour, and he said everywhere he went uh, in the hotels there, he said there just seemed to be a real construction boom going on, there was so much renovation taking place. And the sign that they all had in the American hotels was, it said, please be patient with us, we are under reconstruction. And he said, I wanted to steal a few of those signs and bring them back to Scotland, and he said, and, and dish them out to the congregation and say, wear this, put this around your neck. Please be patient with us, we are under reconstruction. But it's the truth, right? Transformed from one degree of glory into another. And that transformation means we are not perfect yet, right? But it means, I was talking to someone just yesterday who was saying, oh, the struggle with sin is so real, I get so defeated. I said, hey, at least you're struggling with sin. That's the first sign, right? Because there's a change of desire. What does it say about Jesus? He loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And that's the love and hate that comes into your heart. And that's the fulfillment of the promise, by the way, made to the serpent, that his head would be crushed through the seed of the woman. There would be a new humanity in Christ, where Satan would be dethroned from their hearts, and where Christ would be enthroned, and a new love of his evil would come into their hearts, a new hatred of him and his sin would come into their hearts, and they would instead be governed by Christ himself and his power and his spirit. And it changes our loves it changes our hates. i never forget, uh, as a young guy, I was listening to uh, another preacher uh, in our home church in Brisbane, and he was telling the story of a Christian man who came to him in despair and said, um, I don't think I'm saved, I don't think I'm a Christian. And he said, why don't you think so? He said, because I can't stop sinning. He said, okay, let me ask you a question. He said, how do you feel about your sin? Think about it, how do you feel about it? And he said, he clenched his fist so tight, his whole hand went white. And he said, I hate it, like this. <laughs> and he said, you know what? I think you might be saved. Uh, and that's the point. A new love, a new hatred. He loved righteousness, he hated lawlessness. That's a present change of our constitution. But also we see a final change of our destiny. In Christ, we shall be truly made alive. He is the first fruits of them that sleep, each in their own order. First Christ, then us who follow in His image, in His slipstream. Our destiny is changed and it is the destiny of complete glorification, of a restored image of God through the image of Christ, which by the way has so much more in it because of all that He has done to win our salvation. And so we are greatly blessed to be transformed into His image. 
And the Apostle Paul talks about this like running a race. He says, I bring myself under submission in the running of the race, in the fighting of the fight. And here's the thing, when you're running a race, when you're moving to a destination, even in life, when you have an ambition that you want to reach or a goal, what do you do? You start to calibrate every feature of your life, your day, your week towards the achievement of that goal. The actions you take are aligned with where you're going. The decisions you, 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 you take are aligned with where you're going. The things you say no to, the things you say yes to are defined by the destination. And if your destination is to be glorified with Jesus Christ, what you do today will be shaped according to that goal. You will do things that advance you to that goal, that make that goal all the sweeter every day, and you will get rid of all those things that distract you from that goal right here and now. The Apostle John writes, he says, we're God's children now, what we shall be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is, and everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. Our day is shaped by that ultimate destiny. And by the way, if you're living that way, I mean, that's the hope I was talking about before, where no matter what happens in life, you know where you're going. Uh, you know the destination that you have, and your destination is to be as Christ is. Now, that's my question, do we have a present change in constitution because of our connection to the image of Christ in Jesus through the Spirit? And are we disciplining ourselves towards a changed destination? The question we started out with was, who am I? You know what the answer to that question is? The answer to that question is no. You know, when Joshua was on the battlefield, he came across the angel of the Lord and he said, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the angel says, no, I'm the captain of the Lord's army. In other words, Joshua, you asked me a dumb question. It's not about whether I'm with you, it's whether you're with me. Um, and it's the same here, you know, it's a dumb question. It's not about who am I. It's actually about who is God. Because we were made to bear His image. And when we see that in Jesus Christ Himself, everything else is going to fall into place. Let's pray. Our Father in Heaven, we give thanks for the glorious image of Christ, for one who stood where Adam fell, for one who was tempted and stood firm, for one who took on our flesh uh, and won our salvation on our behalf, one who conquered sin, conquered death, and restores us to glory. Lord, we pray that You would help us to have a realistic view of ourselves, made for glory, made of the dust. Help us to embody the, those truths in our lives that would strive for holiness, strive to know You, strive to do righteousness. And Father, that we would be humble, and Father, we'd be dependent as Your creatures. We thank You that Jesus showed us how to do this and leads us in His slipstream. And so, Father, we pray that we'd have a renewed hope in Him this morning. Uh, that we would have a renewed uh, zeal to uh, uh, live for Him and to reach that destination that He has called us to, to be glorified with Him. And Father, help us to test ourselves as well, whether we really know these things and live accordingly, whether we do have a changed constitution, whether the work of the Holy Spirit is in us, making us holy. Uh, we ask that You would help us to reflect and help us to rejoice uh, in the great calling that we've been given through Jesus, in His name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Martin, for delivering the Word of God this morning, and for, for some of us, it's a reminder, for some of us, it's learning about the reality that it's not about who am I, but who is God. Oh, church, the song we're going to respond with takes the attention off ourselves, and it's going to look at the question about who God is, and at the end of the song, the only plea that we ever ask for in this song after we consider about who God is, is May all my days bring glory to your name. So stand with us and sing, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Mm -hmm. 